My name is Mauricio Tenorio. I'm professor of history here at the University of Chicago and also the director of the Center for Latin American Studies. Thank you very much for joining us today here. Uh, this event is co-sponsored by the Center for Latin American Studies and the Frederick Katz Center for Mexican Studies. Uh, we're very happy today. I'm a historian, or so, uh, merely a historian. I couldn't pretend more, and I don't know much about those topics. But as a historian, uh, we always seem to be presenting to our students that Mexico has too many problems. Um, but lately, I've been trying, both as a director, as a historian, to try to reduce Mexico's problem to, in fact, there is only one problem. Mexico has passed all the great tests that modern times um, put to it. Uh, it's an industrial nation, became a very important industrial, one of the most important economies of the world in less than two generations. It's a very wealthy country. The only test that Mexico has not been able to really say anything new about it is inequality, the fight of inequality. And as a historian, as a director of the center, we've been trying to devote a lot of uh, energy to try to discuss this issue in the University of Chicago. That's why since last year we started bringing uh, different economists, different points of view. Uh, Professor Fausto Hernandez was here. Uh, we hope to bring uh, uh, next year uh, uh, Professor Esquivel from El Colegio de Mexico. And it is our great pleasure today to invite one of the most important minds in the fight against inequality in Mexico in the last decade, Santiago Levy. And to introduce Santiago Levy, please join me in welcoming Professor James Heckman, Henry Schultz, Distinguished Professor of Economics in our university. Professor Schultz. It's my great pleasure to be able to introduce Santiago Levy. I've known Santiago, I don't know for how many years, but uh, uh, he's a very distinguished uh, economist, social scientist, and administrator. Currently, he holds the position of vice president for uh, sectors and knowledge at the IEDB. Is that the correct title? Uh, and he has had a distinguished academic career, which I'll briefly review. Uh, before holding this position at the IEDB, he served as a general manager and chief economist for the IDB research Inter uh, department. Uh, I think that we'll hear tonight, if you haven't already seen, uh, a, a splendid example of somebody who combines deep interest in public policy, uh, knowledge with administrative work, as well as a, as a fundamental knowledge of economics. His career has actually spanned uh, several relevant topics for the study of inequality. Prior to joining the IDB, he was the general director for the Mexican Security Institute, the IMSS. I guess it was for about five years, between 2000 and 2005. And prior to that time, Santiago served as the deputy minister for finance and public credit for Mexico. And he became one of the principal architects of the Progresa program, which is widely cited and has been actually a model, not only in Latin America and other countries, but around the world, including the New York City public schools, and trying to use financial incentives to induce parents uh, to, to act in interest to their children. He's also held positions in government, uh, president of the Federal Competition Commission and director of the Economic Deregulation Program at the Ministry of Trade and Industrial Promotion in Mexico. He's a PhD economist. He's written widely on a range of topics. Uh, has, he has in, had faculty positions after completing a PhD at Boston University, faculty positions at ETON in Mexico City, and at Boston University, where he was associate professor and director for the Institute of Economic Development. He's authored more than 75 papers, and, as well as books, monographs, and chapters on a variety of topics, not just about poverty reduction. I think tonight, you, you, I, don't, I don't want to give the list of all of your books, but there's a... The, for the purposes of tonight's lecture, is a, is a recent book called Good Intentions, Bad Outcomes, Social Policy, Informality, and Economic Growth in Mexico. And uh, I look forward, I think it's a, if you haven't read the book, I think you'll find it to be a very interesting discussion. Several of us in the room uh, were interacting with Santiago in Mexico City uh, last fall, discussing the book in, in, in various terms, and I guess we'll, we'll hear about that. 
The title of the lecture for tonight is Social Policy, Informality, and Economic Growth in Mexico. So without further introduction, we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first, let me begin by, by thanking Professor Heckman for very nice words. Thank you, Jim. I very much appreciate that. Um, thanking as well the Center for Latin American Studies and the Center for Mexican Studies, the CAD Center here at the University of Chicago, and, and saying how pleased I am to be here, really, truly thanking you for the invitation, and then daunted by the spot where I'm standing, because Professor Heckman was just telling me that Professor Friedman and Hayek were used to lecture in this room, so um, please adjust the, the <laughs> to not quite exactly the sort of lectures I used to have back then. Um, but, but really, I'm, I'm quite pleased to be here today. So, what I'd like to do, if I can just put this a little bit bigger on the, can you just help me to put it on the full screen? Yeah. As Professor Hegman mentioned just before that, great. Um, I, I, I've, I've been writing on, on various issues having to do with poverty, but more lately I've been thinking about the issue of informality. And, and a couple of years ago, I published a book on, on informality that I've been talking with some various people. And I'd like to present sort of a little bit of the gist of that book tonight. So my main concern is that when, when thinking about social policy in Latin America, and, and a lot of the thrust of what I'm going to say is triggered by Latin America, and particularly by the Mexico situation, is most people who think about social policy ask questions, is social policy fulfilling its role of protecting workers against risk, redistributing income? And that's the first thing that you have to think about when you think about social policy. But my own experience when I was at the Social Security Institute in Mexico is that social policy also have big impacts on incentives of firms and workers. I will be arguing, and that's the title of the book, Bad Outcomes, that in fact it is inducing informality and that informality is actually bad for growth, bad for workers, and in general bad for the economy. And I think these issues that I'm going to talk about are relevant for precisely how effective social programs are to begin with. And I think this is part of the explanation of why productivity is lagging in Latin America and compared to regions of the world. And then I won't have time to discuss about this, but maybe in the Q&A, we'll talk about what is the relevance between the sort of work that I'm doing here about informality and the sort of conditional cash transfer programs of which Progreso Oportunidades was one example in Mexico, but we have many others in other countries. What is the relationship between these targeted poverty programs and social policy more broadly? And I think it's a relevant issue in Latin America now. I've got to go back to begin by the Constitution in Mexico, the ethos of the Mexican Constitution, Article 123 of the Constitution, and all the legal structure and all the laws that are derived from Mexican Constitution make a fundamental distinction, and this is key to the whole story that I'm going to tell, a fundamental distinction between workers that are salaried, and, and that's when there's a firm involved, and I'll come back in a minute, and non-salaried workers. Non-salaried workers are a heterogeneous bunch. They can be self-employed, or you can think of them as one-man firms. Or they can be involved with a firm, but the contract that the worker has with the firm is not a wage-based contract. So salaried workers have a boss. There's a relationship of subordination. And very importantly, by the Constitution, they have a legal entitlement to social security programs. And I come back to what that means. Non-salaried workers can either be self-employed, working on their own, you know, the people who peddle things in the streets of Mexico City. Or they can be engaged with the firm, but not hired by the firm. Engaged with the firm in a non-wage contract, and these contracts can be established as share cropping, share cropping contracts or contracts to elicit risk, like in the insurance industry and like that. The key point here is these, these workers, the law and the Constitution treats them differently. They don't have a right to Social Security. And in the Mexican institutional setup, they receive, and I'll come back to what they mean, social protection programs. This is fundamental institutional distinction. It's in the Constitution and in various fundamental laws. Mutatis mutandis, a structure like this, is in many Latin American countries. So when I speak about social programs, I want to speak about social programs that can be either social security, and I'll be precise what I mean by social security, or social protection. Social program is a very broad term. And then social security is a very different concept from what social security is in the United States. Social security is a very large number of regulations that pertain to salary labor that are contained in many laws, in the labor law, in the social security law, in the housing law, in, in the pension law, and in the fiscal laws, because of this notion of the state protecting workers literally from birth to death. 
when I was head of the Social Security Institute, among other things that I administered, I administered funeral homes as a, aside from administering hospitals because the state was supposed to take care of you literally from birth to death. And that's Social Security and has to do with a, a very large protection net. Social protection programs are also in other laws or in the budget decrees, but the point here is that which social programs you have access to is intimately associated with your labor status. What is social security? It's a bundled package of benefits, so the little plus sign with a circle tries to give the impression that it's bundled. It's all obligatory. The state says salaried workers must be protected by health insurance, by retirement pensions, by civility pensions, life insurance, work risk pensions, blah, blah, blah. Daycare centers, housing, very, very importantly, by protection against unemployment, but in Mexico, protection against unemployment does not take the forms of unemployment insurance, takes the form of severance payment or payments when the firm hiring you, so protection against being fired and hired by firms. And the cost of complying with all that, I'm going to use the letter TF to denote the total cost, the total monetary cost, including the contingent cost, because some of these costs have to do whether you fire or don't fire, of hiring a salaried worker. And beta f is going to be a number between 0 and 1, and I promise not too much math, uh, it's going to be a number between 0 and 1 that says, how do workers value not any individual component of this, but the whole bundle of things? So the utility of being a salaried worker is going to be the wage, the net wage that you get, the take home pay, WF, the net wage, plus the value to you of all these social security benefits. Social protection programs, as opposed to social security programs, social protection programs are unbundled. There are a whole bunch of programs that the government offers to workers that are non-salaried. And in Mexico, they include access to health programs, access to non-contributory pensions, access to daycare programs and to housing programs. So they're in perfect substitute, but they're unbundled and they're voluntary. And TI is going to be the cost per worker of these social protection programs. And UI is the utility of being a non-salaried worker, which is the wage equivalent, the commission, plus the value to you of that bundle. This institutional structure creates important problems from the point of view of the labor market. The fundamental problem that it creates is that a firm that hires a salaried worker has to pay WF plus TF has to pay the full cost, including here the contingent cost of having to fire the worker, of, of the severance pay and all that. The firm has to pay the full cost, but the worker only gets a little bit less than what the firm pays. So it opens a wedge between what the firm pays to the worker and what the worker receives. And I'm going to call that a tax on labor, on a tax on salaried labor. It's not an explicit tax. Because if beta F was exactly equal to 1, in fact, there would be nothing if workers thought that this was exactly worth what they, the firm was paying. And then if you look at non-salaried labor, non-salaried workers are getting a wage. But there's also, they have access to something that the firms that hire them or if they're self-employed, they don't pay for. It's this bundle, the valuation of the social protection programs. And it's equivalent to a subsidy to non-salaried labor. And I've done some econometric estimates. They're imperfect. They can be improved. But there's a large wedge between salary and non salary workers, which is approximately 34% of the wage. All right. So I haven't used the word formality and informality yet. I haven't used the words. I was speaking strictly about salary and non salary And as a quote from Ravi Kambur here, formality is a very imprecise term. It means very many different things for, for different people. I want to use a precise definition of formality. I want to use a definition of formality in which you say, you have to specify the regulation that you refer to to say whether somebody is formal or informal. And I'm going to refer to formal workers as workers that are covered by Social Security. Social Security being this large bundle, including the labor laws to, on, on severance pay and housing and all that stuff. And informal workers are the workers that are not covered by those regulations. And this might result from an illegal act or a legal act. <coughs> Salaried workers in which the firm complies are going to be formal and legal because the firm is complying with the law. Salaried workers that the firm does not register them with Social Security, they're breaking the law, so they're going to be informal and illegal. But then, commissionista workers or self-employed workers 
are not required. In fact, the institutions do not obligate them to be in social security. So they're informal, but they're not breaking the law as the same as these people here. So a few points. Informality is not defined by the size of firms. A lot of the literature says small firms are informal. I will show you data that says that many small firms are formal. Informality is not defined by the size of firms. Informality, very importantly, is not equivalent to illegality. All self-employed workers are informal, but they're not illegal. Informality is not equivalent to non-salaried precisely because there are salaried workers that break the law, the firms that hire them break the law, and therefore they're illegal. And I don't want to associate the word informality with, poor, with poverty. Because this is a construction associated with institutions, not associated with income levels. It's associated with labor status and not income levels. Okay. I want to share a little bit of data of some work that I did when I was at the Social Security Ministry. I, I did the following. I, was, I had access to, a, I was sitting on a gold mine, basically. I was sitting on a gold mine because I realized that I had the names of all the workers that were enrolled in Social Security and I start following them during 10 years. So I have a list of people for 10 years, you know, Jim Heckman and Oliver Sua and Santiago Levy and, and Sergio and Pedro. I had the list of all these workers that were enrolled in Social Security in 1997. That's where in the list. So they were formal in 1997. And then I can observe them for the next 10 years and I can ask the question, if he was formal in 97, was he formal in 98, in 99? And I followed him through 2006. And I split the sample between 2.3 million workers that have high wage, three minimum wages or more, that's the mode of the distribution of wages in Mexico, and low wage. And what I find is that for high wage workers, about 50% of workers that were formal in, in 97 were formal for the next 10 years. But only 16% of the low-wage workers. So on average, what I find is that high-wage workers that were formal in 97 kept that status 77% of the time during the next 10 years. But low-wage workers only kept the formal status during 50% of the time during the next 10 years. Now, Suppose you, see a, you, you observe a low-wage worker in 1997 and you say, look, this guy during the next 10 years was formal 50% of his time. This could be because he was formal 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, five years in a row, and then left formality and was informal. Or it could be because he was formal in 97, informal in 98, formal in 99, informal in 97, etc., etc. So that the entry and exit of informality matter a lot. So now I plot here the frequency of entry and exit, the number of times that a worker entered and exited formality. These are the low wage guys. These are the high wage guys. And the more you move over here, the more there's frequency of entry and exit of workers moving in and out. And what I find, you can see sort of from the graphs, that low wage workers have higher frequency of entry and exit into formality than high wage workers. That's the information from the 10 years of panel data of all the workers that were in, in the form in, in EMS. This is a different data set altogether. This is the employment survey. The employment survey is a panel data that follows workers for one year. So they go to your house in January, in March, in June, in, in September, and in December of the year. The colors are important here. If you look at, this, at the structure of employment in Mexico, you find that the shares of various workers look more or less stable. But now look at the bar on top. The bar on top says, what was the status in 2006 of workers that in 2005 read were informal salaried workers. And the panel data says that 66% of them remained informal salaried workers one year later. But 13.8% green had changed to the status of self-employed or commissionistas. 5.8% yellow had changed to be an openly unemployed. And about 14% had gotten a formal job. So these kind of the transitions of what's happening. Look at these guys. These are the, what was the status in 2006 of guys that in 2005 were self-employed or commissionista? 
and says 75% of them were still self-employed one year later, but 18% of them had switched to be informal salaried workers a year before. So that even though the shares and the composition of employment look more or less constant, they're not the same guys. They're very different, you know, they're, they're, they're changing continuously. So two, imp two important empirical results, low wage workers have lower average permanence informality and they have higher frequency of entry and exit into formality. So the problem for low wage workers, as I see it in Mexico, is not entering into formality, is that they have infrequent stays, they come in and out. And this, you see, it was the normal trending in the labor market. But the important point here, called now the social structure, the change between labor status is not changing jobs that matters here, is the changing between formal and informal because the access to social benefits is going to impact. So what are the implications for social policy? The literature talks a lot about a formal worker. I think we have to be slightly more precise. We have to talk about workers that are presently hired formally. Um, most workers have spells of formality and informality. I will show you data in a minute that shows that firms also hire workers. The same firm has formal and informal workers in the same firm. And only when workers are formal do they get the bundle of protection, the bundle of protection against all the social risks that the government cares about. When they're informal, they don't. And this has important implications for many dimensions of coverage for health, for disability, for work risk and all that. One example is retirement pensions here. If you're only formal part of your time and you have a pension system and you only accumulate in your retirement account when you're formal, what you're going to find is that the densities of contribution to your pensions is going to be very low and the pensions are going to be very low because workers only save into the retirement account when they're formal and because low wage workers are saving less because they're formal less time on average than high wage workers, they're going to have less contribution densities, lower pensions and this is a pension system that is really not going to be very useful from the point of view of low wage workers. I could take the whole talk now and talk about the implications, the social implications of the formal and informal dichotomy. I do that in the book, but I don't want to do that in this talk. What I want to do now is switch gears and talk about the second dimension that I thought was important about social policy. What does this imply in terms of firms? And what does it imply in terms of productivity? This, the social, this dichotomy with formality and informality. So, a Mickey Mouse world. The simplest possible world that you could ever think about, the Mickey Mouse world. Think about there's a demand for salaried labor. There's a demand for self-employed and commissionistas, which I add, it's the total demand for non-salaried labor. The labor force is distributed. Look there, I don't use the word formal because there's no regulation yet. So I use the word salaried, and over there I use the word non-salaried, there are no regulations yet. And in the beginning, as in the Bible, before Social Security was invented. So TF is equal to zero, TI is equal to zero, Bismarck wasn't born, Bismarck is the guy who created, began to push all this back then in, in, in Germany in the late 19th century. And this diagram I could have drawn, all workers with blue eyes and all workers without blue eyes, all workers that are fat and all workers that are thin, it wouldn't matter. So the classification of salary and non-salary doesn't matter, there are no efficiency implications of anything of that sort. Now, Bismarck has a great idea. Social security is created, so now TF is there. But assume for a second that social security is fully valued. All right? So what's gonna happen here is that now workers that are salaried are gonna get this wage, and then they're gonna get this other part in social security benefits. Protection against unemployment in the form of contingent servants pay, health insurance, and all that. But they're very happy, right? The government says to them, we're gonna take from your gross wage that bit and we're gonna give you back in return from that health insurance and daycare centers and housing and blah, blah, blah. And the, and the worker says, oh, that's wonderful. You know, I perfectly value that and therefore nothing happens. Except that these workers, the same number of guys are not protected against any risks these guys are getting the bundles of potential. Note that informal employment, in the sense that now I use the word informal because there's a regulation against informality, the regulation being coverage of social security, so it's a meaningful concept. 
is fully efficient, informal employment is fully efficient, and formal employment is fully efficient. There's a lot of evidence that, unfortunately, social security does not work that well. Workers discount the future, they don't like to be forced to save, they may want to buy health insurance, you know, they're young, they're strong, you know, they say, why do I need health insurance? Why are they forcing me to buy this? So if they don't value that, what that's going to happen is it's going to act like a tax on labor, and the tax on labor is actually going to reduce formal employment, and it's going to reduce formal employment, and it's going to create a, an inefficiency, right? And this is like the standard analysis of any tax in which informality, informality is going to increase from here to here, and some part of informal employment is inefficient because there's excess informal employment as a result of this regulation. Now suppose that you're looking at this graph, the Social Security Institute is covering these workers, and suppose you're the health ministry or the health minister of this country. You say, oh my God, look at all these guys. All these guys here have no health insurance. These guys have health insurance, they're covered by Social Security, but all those guys there are not covered by health insurance. The government realizes that all those people there are not protected against risks, and therefore what they will do is they will begin to create social protection programs for non-salaried workers. And these social protection programs, what they're actually going to do is, in addition to the tax on formal labor that you had before, you're going to add a subsidy to non-salary labor, and what that's actually going to do is it's actually going to increase even more the size of the informal sector, is going to widen the wedge and the productivity loss associated, because now to the tax you add a subsidy that acts in the same direction, and workers are happy because they're getting something, some social protection benefits, right? And because there's mobility of labor in this, in this model here, everybody is enjoying those gains, but look, some workers changed, and some that were protected before against some risks are now not going to be protected against other risks. So, in my three little diagrams, TI, TF equal to zero, T equal to zero, I showed this sequentially. Historically, this didn't happen. Historically, when Mexico created the Social Security Institute in 1943 for salaried workers, they created in parallel also programs, social programs for non-salaried workers. And over time, as the social security was evolving, political pressures and the legitimate interest of the government was actually inducing the creation of social protection programs. Social protection programs, as I show, will widen the gap um, between the marginal products and it's going to make the distortions worse. But from the point of view of the government, it at least is providing workers with some of the benefits that they thought he should be providing them. One last bit here and then I'll, I'll, I'll change. Think now if you're a firm, if you're a firm and you're hiring a worker and you have to pay TF in non-wage costs, but the worker thinks that he's only getting beta F of that TF, there are incentives for the firm to break the law. There are incentives for the firm to hire the worker without enrolling the worker in social security. Of course, firms pay fines if they're caught, and what there's going to be is going to be evasion, and evasion is going to create a category of workers which are informal, even though they should be formal, illegal workers, earning a wage that compensates partly for the fact that they don't get social security benefits, and that distributes the rent between the firm and the worker by evading the law. I'm not going to go through this diagram. What illegality will do is it will increase salaried employment because firms now hired salaried workers, but it will reduce formal employment because salaried workers are being hired illegally. So I, I, I end here. Why do I argue in my book that social programs induce informality? Not social security, not social protection, social programs induce informality. First, because the institutional construction, the constitution, the labor law, excludes from the obligation of social security non-salaried workers. Because social security doesn't work very well and it acts like a tax on salaried labor, 
because in addition, social protection programs are like a subsidy to non salary labor, and because firms have incentives to break the law, hiring salaried workers without social security. So I argue that informality is a result of social programs. I don't deny that there are other sources of informality having to do with income taxes and evasion of income taxes and cost of registering and all that. In the book I discuss it a little bit, but I, I want to emphasize the fact, and that's the key point that I'm trying to make, is that social programs, the architecture of social programs has these effects. And just to give you a sense of my view of Mexico, of how big these effects are, in Mexico we have about 14 million formal workers, about 8 million illegally hired workers, so illegal salaried employment is big, incentives to evade are very big, about 17.6 non-salaried workers. By my calculations, there's a tax of about 2.4% of GDP on salaried labor, and that's why you have these effects. And the total cost of the subsidies to social protection programs is about 2% of GDP. I take this from the, from the expenditure data of the income accounts. So it's not a small subsidy. And this one over here, note, it's a subsidy to illegality. Because the government is providing free social protection programs to salaried workers that should be getting social security benefits paid by the firms. I just want to call attention that, that in this structure, TF is a vector of health insurance plus severance pay plus all the social security programs. That's the valuation over the vector. TI is a vector of social protection programs, health, non-contributory pensions and all that. And the labor market will behave a little bit like that. What happens to formal employment, informal employment and wage rates? And a very important point that I want to call attention to, which is part of the dilemma that I want to, that, that, that is sort of the core point of my book, is as you increase social protection programs, which is natural because the government is trying to fight, uh, you know, to increase the welfare of, of, of workers, productivity is going to go down even though the utility of workers is going to go up. And in my view, this creates a very big dilemma for the government. The government wants to protect workers in the informal sector, but when it does, it creates bigger gaps and it actually reduces productivity. So this is a graph recently of some program. Um, this is not my work. This is work by, by some other people. A, a recent paper that was just presented at the IDB um, of people that have trying to use a counterfactual um, analysis of what has been the impact of one single social protection program at the federal level, the Seguro Popular, and they've sort of mapped now the behavior of formal employment with and without the program, taking it with lags and all that stuff. I, I am not qualified to speak a lot about the econometrics, but what they find is that that sign that I'm speaking about is there. And this is another interesting program. In Mexico City, the mayor of Mexico City introduced a health program for women. And a researcher at the time compared what happened to the probabilities of women being in formal employment in Mexico City, comparing them, DF is Mexico City, with Monterrey and Guadalajara. So comparing what happened in two large cities, Monterrey and Guadalajara, with Mexico City, what he found is the introduction of a health program at, in, in Mexico City had implications of that sort. Now I want to talk a little bit more about the productivity story because it's sort of central to the dilemma between social welfare and productivity that I'm trying to call attention to. All right, so you now live in an economy in which firms face a tax when they hire legally salaried workers and they face a subsidy when they engage with non-salaried workers. So what's going to happen is there are going to be a lot of labor contracts that are going to be changing. Firms are going to try to simulate. Lots of cheating, lots of outsourcing, right? Lots of work for lawyers. I spent five years at the Social Security Institute fighting lawyers uh, because they were legally violating the law. And because there's subsidy to non-salary employment, self-employment is going to, to change. And firms hiring salaried workers will cheat. And depending on the enforcement of the effort, the government will adapt a little bit of what they do in response to that effort. Oh, the graph didn't work here. For some reason, there's a graph there that didn't work. Um, but that graph basically tried to show 
that if the probability that the government finds you is associated with the size of the firm, not all firms are going to cheat. Because if you're a large firm, 100 workers or more, it's very, very, very likely, almost a certainty, that the government will find you. So that automobile production and steel production is always going to be formal. Because you're not, you're not going to cheat because they're, what's the point? They're going to catch you. And the fines are bigger than what you're evading. But if you're a small little transport firm with one truck and two workers moving cargo between two small cities of Mexico, um, you, you're going to be informal. Because actually, the, the chances that you're going to be caught are going to be very, very small. So firms will self-select between one and the other, depending on how they can cheat or not cheat. And this matters a lot for productivity. I'm going to skip this part because I'm running out of time. I want to show you these numbers of an exercise that I did. So INEGI is a registry of firms from the census data. IMSS is a registry of firms actually registered with the Social Security Institute. So in Mexico, there are 3 million firms, but there are only 760,000 firms registered with the Social Security Institute. And here is by distribution by firm size. As you can see, most of the very small firms between zero and five workers are the firms that are actually cheating, even though, even though there are small firms registered in Social Security. That's why associating formality with the size of firm is wrong, right? This endogenous process here, sorting firms into one status and to the other status. And I don't know whether Chang is here, um, or he was here before he probably left. There's a researcher, there's a professor here at the Booth School whose quote, whose work I've been quoting. They've been trying to do a methodology to try to assess what happens to total factor productivity when there's a dispersion in the marginal products of labor and capital across firms. And they've done some work for Mexico, and this is from their paper, and basically they say, look, all firms at the four-digit level, I'm going to classify into the ones that have total factor productivity at those four-digit levels higher than the average and the ones that have lower than the average. So they're comparing firms that produce shirts with firms that produce shirts, firms that produce steel with firms that produce steel, and what they find is there are small firms that are very productive, but the large majority of those firms are actually less than productive. There are large firms that are low productivity firms, but the majority of the productivity firms. And I've matched that by doing an index of formality of firms. I don't have time to go into the details here, but I sort of label firms by formal, informal. And basically all I want to show you is that the association of informal firms with low productivity firms is there and most, low, most informal firms are going to be low productivity firms. In that paper by Chiang, he does a very interesting example. He says, what if I compare exactly the same thing between the United States and Mexico for the same industries and the same uh, products and the same methodology and the same assumptions? And he says, look, this is the distribution of TFP. So in the United States, there are also firms that are more productive than the average and firms that are less productive than the average, but there's a lot less dispersion in Mexico, the dispersion is much bigger, and there's a much larger share of firms in the unproductive side. And as I showed you before, a lot of these firms are the informal firms. Uh, the total factor of productivity, the total amount of output that can be produced from labor and capital in a particular firm. Now, the census data that I was showing you before and the productivity things that I was showing you before, the census is not a census even though it's called a census. The census in Mexico only picks up firms that are, registered, that are in a fixed establishment. There has to be a roof. There has to be something fixed. The census does not pick up all economic activity that is in the streets. All the tianguis and all the people selling things in the street are not picked up. So this is the Mexico labor force in 2003 which I reconstructed from the census and the unemployment service. Blue is the census. What I showed you before is what the census picks up. Gray are public sector workers, all the bureaucrats. Green are workers in agriculture. And red are urban workers not in a firm captured by the census. <laughs> 
These are working alone. These are guys working in firms of two to three. You must have been in Mexico City and you must have seen a place where they sell you juices in the street. Right? So there's a guy making the juice very quickly, bzzz, right? and somebody else behind wash, quickly washing the, the glasses, and somebody selling it to the guy. That's a firm here. Okay? And those are the firms. So that's 2003. That's by firm size. The ones in light blue have social security. They're formal. The ones in dark blue don't have informal. And as you can see, informality is huge. The TFP calculations that I showed you pick up what's happening in this economy. They don't pick up what's happening in this part of the economy because we can't make those measurements. And an interesting research challenge to the future is to make measurements of what's happening there. Same picture for 2008, all right? Change between 2008 and 2003. Increase formal employment in zero to five firms, informal employment in zero to five firms, formal employment in six to 10 worker firms, informal six to 10, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line, the change in formal employment in the private economy, 2 million people, 2.5 million people enter the labor force between these five years. 1 million entered the formal labor force in the private economy. Half a million were bureaucrats, so these are not part of the story. And 1.1 were informal. What's interesting to note is that between these three years, this is between 2003 and 2008, no economic crisis. This is before 2009. The census is not affected by the 2009 crisis. So if in formal employment, you take away the public sector workers and you're only looking at what's happening with firms, informal employment is, is happening here. Very worrisome, no macro crisis, no credit crisis, no hyperinflation, the economy growing, everything nice and dandy. What is happening to the incentive structure of this economy that is generating these outcomes? And I have one more graph to, you, to show you. Wait, wait. This is an, a, a really, I just did this. This is not in the book. The 2008 census just came out about two months ago. So this is, again, census data, census data, census data, IMS data, IMS data, IMS data. On top, Orange, 0 to 5 workers, green, 6 to 10, blue, 11 to 50, yellow, 51 or more. The size of the balls is proportional to what is going on. So in, two, in 98, 2.8 million firms, 680,000 registered in Social Security. In 2003, 3 million firms, 770,000 registered in Social Security. In 2008, 3.7 million firms, 795. Huge growth in the number of firms. Hardly any growth in the number of registered firms. Most firms that have been created over the last five years are informal firms. And most firms are small. And as I show you with the composition of employment, the composition of employment is shifting into the smaller part. In fact, look. But look at this. Illegality is growing immensely in the economy. And here I have the proportion of firms by range of workers, 1 to 2, 3 to 5, 6 to 10, that are not registered. 98, 2003, 2008. In 98, already about 83% of firms that were very small were not registered. But look at what happened between, for firms to 3 to 5. In 98, 64% of firms were not registered. That increased to 68% five years later. And that increased to 80% five years later. Even here, these are not smaller firms. You know, these are by Mexican standards, these are medium sized firms. And you have now firms, 32% of firms of between 11 and 15 workers are informal firms. The degree of illegality and the degree of informality in the economy is changing. And I want to go back to this point. 
No macro crisis, no credit crisis, no major changes in TF, important changes in TI. What is happening in the incentive structure of this economy that is generating the size distribution of firms? This is a little bit of data on what is happening to spending in social protection programs. What is TF? This is TI. This is TF. And that's what's happening to completion expenditure. So my hypothesis is that Mexico might be caught in a vicious circle of informality and low productivity. They're bad jobs, you know, in erratic jobs, infrequent jobs. The government reacts by saying, look, we need more social programs for informal workers. But really what you end up doing is you're subsidizing more the informal sector, more small firms, more illegal firms. I skipped a little bit on dynamic productivity and maybe in the Q&A we can talk a little bit about that because that's a very important point but I don't have time to discuss it. More evasion, and I'll show you what happened to that. Worse jobs and on and on. So I, I was told I could speak for 45 minutes. I just need, I'm on 43 minutes so I'm going to take three minutes to make my concluding remarks. I apologize for running through this material. I wanted to sort of share this last part that I, that I was doing here and maybe in the Q&A we can talk about sort of dynamics of an old technical part. All right. First point. First point is methodological. You'll find, I don't know how many papers that talk about formality, informality, social safety nets, social protection, social programs, informal. This discussion needs more precision in the language. I, I sometimes say, imagine macroeconomists who define the real exchange aid one as traded to non-traded, the other one as non-traded to traded, the other one as the peso to the dollar, and the other one as the dollar to the peso. So they're four macroeconomists, they each have a different definition of the real exchange rate, and they're talking about the real exchange rate. It's a cacophony, right? So there's a cacophony of people talking about formality and informality because the language needs to be a lot more precise. In my view, and we can talk about conditional cash transfer programs in a minute in the q and I, I took away the slides for reasons of time. There needs to be a distinction between programs that are protecting workers against risks. That's what Social Security is doing. Disability risk, you know, unemployment risk, um, death, health, and whatnot. Between programs that are trying to transfer income, like Progresa, associated with investments in human capital or not. Very important point. There's been a huge amount of empirical work, and, and, and some people in this room have contributed to that, on evaluating the impact of individual programs. But I think we need to understand better the interaction between all these programs. TF and TI are vectors of various programs that are changing the incentive structure of the whole economy. You know, there's a huge amount of treatment control, very useful, very valuable, essential. But you can't take, say, a program individually and then you have to ask yourself the question, in the whole broader incentive structure of this economy, how does this program fit with the rest of the programs? And so I think we need to move, and this is a big methodological challenge, to evaluate strategies. A set of social programs interacting all with each other, how does that work out? I, I'm arguing, I've argued that social programs can have unintended perverse incentives. That's why the title of my book, Good Intentions, Bad Outcomes. I focus on the formal informal dichotomy. I've argued that social programs are a cause of informality for the four reasons that I argued before. And I've also argued that informality is a source of low productivity. And I'm really concerned about what is happening to social policy in Mexico because we're creating a parallel system of social security, an imperfect substitute for social security, in response to a malfunctioning social security, all our labor regulations and all the severance pay and all that stuff, which is financed from different sources. It's an understandable response from the government, but it's a flawed response for the government. And it's not really helping Mexico yet. And I will not talk about this. In, in my book, what I do is I'm making a proposal now to a major reform of social programs to go to a system of universal social rights that are financed out of consumption taxes, not out of wage-based taxes part and the other part out of other taxes but as homogeneous financing for everything that would allow the government to really comply with the social goals of protecting workers but would bypass these huge distortions in terms of productivity, illegality, evasion, 
that I think are now part of the explanation, not the full explanation, but in my view, part of the explanation for why Mexico is not growing and why we're not making more headway when we should be doing it. So I took a little bit more time than I should have. Thank you. We have time for some questions. And I know there are people in the room who have actively debated, including <laughs> me. But I'll refrain for a minute, and I'll call on Oliver. <laughs> no, Oliver and... Uh, uh, no, I, I'm really, seriously, I'm not, <laughs> but it would be good if we could talk. I mean, there, sure. is, there is an issue. Let me just sort of open the question to, to a general discussion. Oh, okay. I think it's a small enough room that it doesn't matter, but let me... It's just for Oh, I see. Okay, you want to record this. No, I guess the question is the quantitative importance of these various trends. So, you know, also the trade pattern of China versus Mexico, and, and there are a number of reasons why you might think that there would be this pattern of, uh, of, of Mexico under stress. But is it not the case, or, or what, what would you say would be the case, that it is fundamentally the regulation that is causing the problem? The fact that you have a fairly rigid or quite rigid labor market by any quantitative measurement. And that you add to that some other strains, like trade strains, the addition of the Seguro Popular program and other programs, on top of that. So I'm wondering if you can give some kind of quantitative importance, and then I'll call on all of No, I, At least frame the discussion. No, I, I think James' question um, is very well. I, I, I try to represent all the rigidities in the labor market under TF. Mm -hmm. And TF is, captures all these difficulties of firing workers and all the contingent cost of firms of having the severance pay. In fact, I use some of the numbers you work with Carmen to, to, to compute that. Um, so I think TF is a central component of the story. And in my view of the division between TF plus TI of the total distortion, about three quarters is TF and, and about a quarter is TI. Mm -hmm. The only point that I'm making is that at the margin, TI is getting bigger. What the direction of policy has been over the last 10 years is there haven't been any major legal changes in the labor law, there haven't been any major legal changes in any of the regulations, Inframarginal, they're very big, as I said, it's 375% three, three, of the story mm -hmm. by my by account of 2007, and about 25% of the story is TI. The problem is that TI is getting bigger and bigger. And, and um, but, so, but sort of left, both. But left no. out of the story is some of the competitive position of, uh, and so forth, and, and, and the aspects of inflexibility in the labor market in terms of the response to the... So, so, so let, let me come to, yeah. the, to the second part. It's also true that Mexico has been facing more competition from China. Yes. We are we're in the U.S. market. We're competitive with China, which more or produce goods that are similar. So, the way I think about that, in, in my view, is so that's a, sh a shock to Mexico. The entry of China into the World Trade Organization and all that—it's a shock to Mexico. The question is, why would that change the formal informal composition of the labor force? If beta f was equal to one that shock would lower wages, but would not necessarily change the formal informal composition of the labor force. Now, if firms are cheating, if firms are cheating, and I didn't go here through some of, some of the, firms are hiring optimally f formal and informal workers. Right. When they face a shock, a, a negative shock, it is optimal for them to change the proportions of informal to formal workers. Right. So part of the res to response, but this only happens when, to begin with, their incentives to cheat. And what creates incentives to cheat is the regulation. The regulation. It's TF. Right. right. Okay. So, so TF is a very... So I'm not arguing that TI is a story. Right. I'm, I'm arguing TI does not fix the problem. But I guess the question, if you were given powers in the Mexican government to reform any particular set of laws, in which margin would you think it would have the greatest effectiveness in terms of... I, I would guess it would be reducing the regulatory burden, right? It kind of creates these aftershocks. Well, that, that's all I. That's what I really want you to say. But, uh, <laughs> maybe you won't say it. <laughs> if I had all the powers, yes, I, I would really ask myself a fundamental question. Under this institutional construction, mm -hmm. inherited in Article 123 of the Constitution, and this dichotomy between salary and salary labor, under that institutional structure, am I ever going to simultaneously be able to increase productivity? and protect all workers against risks? Since the answer to that is no, right. if I had all powers, I would go back to Article 123 of the Constitution and change that institutional structure. And then, as I say, 
remove TF, remove TI, and go to a system of universal rights. And how far do you think we are from that in terms of Mexican politics? <laughs> My guess is very far. Well, no, 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 it depends. Ah. It depends. Because, see, the, the important point here is to realize that at the marginal change that the government has been making have been going in the wrong direction. I am of the opinion that, and I've, you know, this is completely off the record, I've talked to some legislators and some people from the time I was in government. If you offer the Mexican population a new, a new deal, a new arrangement, and you said, look, we will extend social rights to all workers so that all workers will have a right to health insurance, all workers will have a right to disability, to death. We can extend social rights to all workers. We will exchange that for a consumption tax. We can compensate the negative effect of the consumption tax on low-income households through some kind of his compensation, and I've calculated how you do that and how much that would cost. You can show an equilibrium in which all low-wage workers are better off, productivity is higher, and eventually real wages are higher. So I think the system is so profoundly inefficient, so profoundly inefficient, that there's room for a policy that moves in that direction. Now, at what speed do you do it? And what do you begin to do, to do first? The first point that I'm trying to make to policymakers is, look, we're going in the wrong direction. Second point is, all right, let's begin to reduce TF little by little, those regulations, little by little, gradually, and extend workers' rights and begin to change consumption taxes to replace all those social security contributions. This can be a you know, five-year transition, seven-year transition, but that's, that would be my answer if I had all the powers. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Other questions? You're treating workers are, as perfect substitutes, right? So, and that's, that's as you showed in the, in the very beginning of the presentation. So there is a huge difference in in the, the, the quality of the worker. So it's it's the the characteristics of each sector for just to avoid the or to name them, is, are completely different. So in the margin, these kind of programs are going to have a real small effect. And that's what we find in this paper uh, with Professor Marinescu also. So the effect is not as high as you will expect if they are perfect substitutes, right? So um, yeah. I think, in general, we agree on, the, on some of the bad <laughs> policies. But uh, I think the effect is not, not that big. And we think, well. Another issue that should be analyzed is what, what are the gains of these, kind, of these social programs overall? <coughs> so having a, a healthier uh, population will also have a huge improvement on productivity. So there are some aspects of these, uh, of these uh, kind of programs that should be also analyzed. And, and the, the questions are open and there is the evidence should be, or the, uh, the, the science, or the, <coughs> the work should be done on, on these kind of questions. That's, Basically. Two points. Two, very good question. Two points. So, so I'm the. I'm going to use an analogy. See if it works. Maybe it doesn't work. Okay. There's a distribution of drivers. Careful drivers, reckless drivers, young drivers, old drivers. But the government has a regulation that says, regardless of who the driver is, when there's a red light, you have to stop, and in this road, you don't go beyond 60. And it, the government has social goals and says, look, I want workers to save for retirement. I want workers to be covered by health insurance. And the question is, is that associated with being salaried? If the answer is no, and I don't see why you would associate salaried workers must be protected against health risks, but non-salaried workers should not, then if you want all workers to be protected by health insurance, then you have to use an instrument that covers all workers, and you can't use an instrument that only focuses on a subset of workers. So from the point of view of social policy, the fact that workers have a distribution of abilities and a distribution of, of you know, different characteristics, if you're really thinking about the social risk element that you're protecting them against, is not the relevant consideration. Now, on the productivity side, one more thing on the social. The, depends on the social welfare function if this is actually increasing social welfare because suppose that some workers didn't have health insurance before. Now you create a, health ins a social protection health insurance program. 
clearly better off workers because they have health insurance. But to the extent that formal employment went down, the number of workers saving for a pension is going to go down. So the government is getting more on workers being protected against the health risks, and the government is getting less by workers being protected against longevity risk. So it's not clear from the social welfare point of view that in fact you're getting that, and you can see that in the graphs I show for the pension system. What is happening to the pension system in Mexico is that it's being eroded. Because the more informal employment is increasing, the, the whole Afore system, the whole pension system is actually not working. And a very serious consideration, and I feel partly responsible because I worked on this law when I was in the government, is that with all these formal informal dichotomy, most low wage workers are not going to qualify for a minimum. So the social is not so clear. On the productivity, clearly more healthy workers are going to work. But look what is happening to, why, why do you have to pay all those productivity costs to get those healthy workers? You're using a very third best instrument. Why can't you use an instrument that is more directly where you want to go? That's the point that I'm making. Just to add on the heterogeneity part, there's also the fact that uh, the fact that informal firms are less productive is that's descriptively correct. Of course, that doesn't mean that informality is causing uh, low productivity. Just like you have worker types, you have firm types, mm -hmm. and there are reasons why the more productive firms would choose to be formal and the less productive informal. So therefore, it's not entirely clear that you know, just being informal per se uh, is causing informality. And to come back to the pension thing, uh, always when you, you think of workers, you have to think who's the marginal worker who might switch between formal and informal. For example, when we introduce something like Seguro Popular, if that marginal worker was already very, had very little presence in the formal sector, they haven't contributed enough to constitute any significant pension rights. So even if they were to switch on a more permanent basis to informal, the loss is, given the schedule of how you contribute to the pensions might be uh, fairly small. So I, I completely agree with the general theory, but you know, we have to look into the detail of how, how it happens in practice. On the distribution of firms, I think you can talk about the distribution of, pro of productivity of firms, and you saw for the US you know, that you also have the same, although the, the Mexican won't look different. The, the issue is the construction to begin with, the conceptual construction of, of formal and informal, and the reason we label firms as formal and informal firms, in, in the way I, I, I might be wrong, in the way I see things, is caused by social policy because the, the this definition itself of what is formal is a definition that takes as the reference point a social regulation. That's why I separate informality from illegality, right? So. You can have a distribution of productive and non-productive firms in another country that has a very different construction in terms of social policy, and you would not label firms formal and informal. Probably in the US, you, can, you wouldn't use those labels. And you have a, a distribution. All I'm arguing is the social regulations create the formal-informal dichotomy. It's, it's sort of, and the response of firms creates distortions that increase productivity losses. If I compare the Mexico to the US, but something is happening in Mexico that is not happening in the U.S. He's getting is worth the money that the firm is paying. And there are many reasons, but a very important reason in the case of Mexico, you're absolutely right, is that the quality of services that workers get from the government is very, very low quality. And I'm embarrassed to say, you know, I, when I was at the Social Security Institute, you know, it, it's, it, we provide very low quality service. You know, it, it, it is workers, you, you go to a worker and you say, look, we're going to enroll you in Social Security, and you would say the worker is very happy because now he's going to have access to the Eames clinics. Right? People don't think very highly of Eames clinics, unfortunately. There are long lines, there are you know, not enough medicines, the doctors don't treat them very well. So quality is an issue of why BTIF is less than one, and certainly in any reform, the quality issue should, should be tackled. I fully agree. In that sense, informality per se may be a good thing. Yeah, look, from the point of view, informality here is bad from the point of view of the government because the government is not complying with its social goals. Is informal, I didn't talk here about the fiscal implications of informality, but it's obvious that it has negative fiscal implications because 
you're losing all this revenue and all that. And it's, in for, it's bad from the point of view of productivity. From the point of view of workers, workers, workers are trying to do their best, right? And being informal is not necessarily worse off from his point of view than being formal. I think there are various factors interact, and we didn't talk about dynamic productivity. And, 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 and in the paper by Jim and, 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 and Pedro and, and Oliver, they talk about that, which I think is a super interesting aspect for research. In terms of firms, in, these informal firms, first, they have to be very small. So sometimes exploiting economies of scale is not there. There's a trade off between economies of scale and being able to hide from the authorities and being able to be informal. So they, you can't really exploit economies of scale. Second, they're facing different factor prices, right? Because they're paying for labor less than what they're paying for labor in the formal firms. The margin products are not the same, and that's why this is less in the formal firm, because they don't have to pay all the TF, which has to be paid in the formal firms. There's, these firms are very small, and they don't have access to credit, or they don't have access to formal credit. So if there's a shock, sometimes the firm really goes under, the workers get laid off, so the survival rates of these firms are very small. The survival rates imply that firms perhaps don't have as many incentives to invest in training workers, in adopting technology, in technology, in, in, in innovation. So the, the general atmosphere, De Soto, Hernando De Soto has some very nice, uh, very nice book on, on, on Peru that describes that. I'll give you an example from Mexico, from, from the number was there. So there is a large firm in the state of Puebla that exported jeans to the United States. You know, very, very large firm, a maquiladora firm. And then they subcontracted to very many little small firms in the houses of people that had four or five sewing machines who produced pretty much the same genes. And then the genes would be sent by a third party to evade the tax authority by a third party to the large firms. The firm would add the trademark here in the back, and then they would be put for export. And if you really think what's happening is that it's really a vertically integrated firm but that it's operating in a very inefficient way. There's a firm here, and that very many little, little firms here that are also making pretty much the same product. And the firm is really basically lowering its labor cost. It only pays social security contributions on the subset of, firm, of workers that the firm actually has. And there are very many tiny, tiny little firms around it providing pretty much the same genes in back shops with very little economies of scale. That's socially inefficient, but privately it, it made sense for the firms to do it. See, PTAF is evaluation over the whole package because workers don't have a choice to say, I do want health insurance, but I don't want to save my pension, or I don't want a housing loan. It, they're forced to the whole package. It's a bundle package. Which elements of the, uh, will, the, will the government be less willing to, to reduce? The severance pay and the restrictions on firing are very important contingent costs. I actually think your numbers with Carmen underestimate. I think it's actually a bigger distortion. Um, it, it's even more costly um, because there's a risk of reinstatement, which is the risk that the, a, a court will tell you to rehire back the worker and pay all the fallen wages while the guy, while the guy was, was fired. Um, so, so that is a very big cost in my view and it's a big deterrent. That regulation is a very big deterrent to, to formal employment. My own view is that that will never change unless the government does something else, unless we substitute all that by unemployment insurance. And I didn't talk about that part here, but as part of this broad reform, the mechanisms for protecting workers against output shocks, the severance pay and all that stuff, which is actually, as opposed to many other stuff which is in the labor law or in the social security law, the stuff on severance pay is actually on Article 123 of the Constitution. So changing that is going to be extremely difficult unless there's a benefit to workers, and I can think of only unemployment insurance to do that. That might take 10 years, um, 
but you have to begin to build the blocks. It's five years before, well, seven now. No, to get to. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. No, no, I understand. But that's a huge reform. I mean, there's, there's a sense in which the tax base is very weak in Mexico compared to other countries. And kind of the fiscal leverage that Mexico has, say, compared to some European countries is really quite limited. Right? Very important point, and, and very good point. <coughs> what Jim is saying is Mexico's tax base is extremely weak. And therefore, it would be extremely difficult to do the sort of thing that I'm talking about. Right. But that's precisely the opportunity. Why? The reason that the tax base in Mexico is so weak is particularly the VAT. Revenues from income taxes are not that, that low compared to other countries, but the revenues from consumption tax. And the reason is that the government uses the VAT as a redistributive mechanism. It has a zero rate on food, medicines, and a whole bunch of exemptions, and a 15, 16% rate now on everything else. We collect very little on VAT. We collect only about 3% of GDP on VAT. And we should be collecting about 8, 9% of GDP on VAT. My proposal is to increase the VAT rate to 16% on everything. This would generate, depending on how the simulations, and I'm working on this now, between 4.4 and 5% more points of, GDP, of, of, of revenues. Clearly, there's a, redistribute, a negative redistributive impact of increasing the VAT rate because the price of, consum of food, medicines, and all that would go up for lower income households. I've calculated what would be the Hicks compensation that you would have to pay them to leave them in the same real income. And because the distribution of income in Mexico is so unequal, the amount of money that you need to compensate the low income households is very little. So you can actually do a VAT reform in which you make consumption taxes go up for everybody, you strengthen the tax base, you have to increase revenues by 4 or 5% of GDP. And you can compensate with about half a percent of GDP low-income households for the additional consumption taxes that they're paying. And then you can begin to do this kind of thing. The sort of thing that I'm proposing without a fiscal reform is unthinkable. And precisely the point that I'm trying to make is Mexico needs a new fiscal pact and a new social pact. Nobody asks here how TI is being paid for. TI is being paid for with the oil rents, which is very sad, because what you're having is an economy in which it's taking a, a, you know, this natural resource, exhaustible natural resource, and is being used to subsidize illegal behavior <laughs> and to erode the tax base. So we need a new fiscal pact. And, and, and in the book, I discuss that any of my reforms, unless you tackle the fiscal reasons the deep fiscal reasons behind this is not going to go anywhere. But if we don't tackle those serious problems and we try to keep on patching it, my own reading, I was in the government 15 years, is we, we're experts at patching the little problem with a little Band-Aid and then you know, putting a little Band-Aid on top of the other Band-Aid and then when the Biden isn't working, putting, you know, the, 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 the cumulus of distortions that we've added into the economy is so large by now that we have this very low performance. And we have to begin to tackle the more serious, deeper issues if we really want to grow faster. And the fiscal one is inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've read about your proposal before, but it seems to me that you know, there is, a, there is a, not only the implementation question, the big question, but the question before, which is like the political question of, um, what I mean, in terms of the probability of, of, of this really picking up and flying, how do you see it? I mean, what should happen in order for this sort of proposal to really become uh, you know, uh, a reality? I don't know the answer to that. Where I'm at now is at the point of trying to call attention to the fact that what we're doing is in the wrong direction. I think the if you calculate what has happened to productivity in Mexico, and even if you compare it to Brazil, to Chile, to other countries in Latin America, we're underperforming even compared to these other countries in Latin America. Eventually, society has to wake up to the fact that unless these serious distortions are tackled, we're going to be a mediocre country for many, many years to come. What is the political equilibrium that allows the sort of stuff that I'm talking about to happen here? It's a political equilibrium that is constructed, in my view, against an extension of social rights. So it is not seen as a 
technocratic neoliberal reform of the past, right? So it's constructed against the extension of social rights. It's constructed with a strong redistributive element because my proposal, I didn't speak about this here, my proposal would actually redistribute income in a, in a very nice way towards lower income households because if everybody gets the same benefit but the higher income households pay more consumption taxes than the lower income households, then you're going to be redistributing income. And it helps reduce inequality. I've done some calculations what happens to the Gini and all that. So the, the, the idea is construct a coalition against, uh, around the idea of universal social rights for all workers and construct a coalition against on the, in favor of, of low income households. Who would oppose it? The very strong labor unions that have nothing to gain in the sort of proposal that I have here. A lot of people that sort of rent seek around the, the current status. But most firms that are illegal, and remember most firms in Mexico are illegal, would actually applaud a proposal when you came to them and you say, look, now you can hire workers and you don't have to worry about all these non-wage costs and all these contingencies of severance pay and all that stuff. You can grow, you can invest in technology, you can invest in training, you can have any size you want, and we're going to give you a different deal. Those have actually no voice today. And, and, and the, the real leadership issue here is how to construct it. Now, it might sound far-fetched. Okay, I'll just put a little semicolon on that. When I was pushing Progresa, people thought this was nuts, right? And say, yeah, you're going to give money to people, and you're going to give money to households, and you're crazy, blah, blah. Now, this is much bigger than that. But it's not impossible. The numbers work out. The political economy is more difficult. The numbers work out. What well, last point on Progresa? Oh, I, I didn't speak about this here. comes to your point about the marginal worker. The government is also doing something else that I didn't describe here, but it's focusing TI on poor workers. By focusing TI on poor workers, it's actually inducing poor workers to be informal. They're going to get lower real wages. Progresa was actually trying to invest in their human capital, so when they entered into the labor market in the future, they would earn higher real wages. But the incentive structure is contradictory, because even though you're investing in the human capital of these workers, you're inducing them in the labor market into the informal sector with lower wages. So the idea of breaking the intergenerational transmission of poverty is more difficult in the context of where you have high, high informality and growing informality. I'm sad because I think actually that a lot of the work on Progresa is not going to have fair bull fruitions because these workers are going to have more years of education, they're going to be healthier, but they're not going to find better jobs than their parents. And if you see what happens to the size division of firms, I think that's what's happening. So, so your next book should include investment, both on the firm side <laughs> yeah. and on the personal Well, that's the dynamic part that few people do. The dynamic <laughs> part. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Oh, okay.